Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Edinger and Rachel Wojtek, and we have reached the intertestamental period, the 400 silent years, the Hellenistic age, whatever you want to call it. For some reason, it always comes in a chunk, and we kind of need to break that down because people did not sit around twiddling their thumbs for 400 years saying, ah, we are in the intertestamental period. <laughs> and nothing can possibly happen here. Right. Well, before we so boldly go where everybody's twiddling their thumbs, <laughs> um, a few things about Greece. We kind of skipped over. We got as far as the greco persian Wars. Um, Thermopylae and Salamis and all of that, Plataea. Uh, and then we jumped to the Greek philosophers, the pre-Socratics, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. And from Aristotle, the obvious place to go is Alexander. And that takes not a lot of time because he died when he was quite young. But there were some things that happened along the line that at least we probably should mention. This is not exactly a history class, but just so that people know the world didn't stand still waiting for Alexander to come on the scene. Uh, in the wake of the Persian Wars, uh, the – let me back up. There, is, there was no such thing as Greece. There were right. city-states that Key. were Greekish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they spent a lot of time fighting each other. Occasionally, they would band together under the leadership of one or the other of the more prominent cities, usually Athens or Sparta. Uh, and so when we look and say Greece, we're already sort of distorting history. And of course, Alexander was not technically Greek. He was Macedonian. And from the point of view of other Greekish city-states, something of a barbarian, an <laughs> outlier. Uh, but when the history books focus on Greece, they they focus on the time just before the coming of Alexander, things that had happened. Athens and Sparta had become, in general, the two leading city-states, and they form a nice contrast. Sparta's uh, agricultural, landlocked, uh, was founded by people who invaded and took over the local population and thus had to keep an eye on them all the time. So very warlike. If you were a Spartan male, you were part of the army after a certain age, and you picked up a male older soldier who would look after you in lots of ways. Yeah. Uh, Athens uh, was settled a little more peacefully, and while there was this slower class of people who had been there first, the Athenians didn't have to keep an eye on them, and so there wasn't that the the fear of having to oppress a people just to make sure we don't lose everything. Uh, initially, the mountains of uh, in and about Athens and, and the Greek other Greek city states uh, were good for grapes and olives and all of that. But in time, the Greeks were such poor managers of their natural resources that that kind of faded out on them, and Athens went to the sea, and in going to the sea, planted colonies all over the Mediterranean. So this is a great colonial age. And some of those we know, uh, Neapolis is Naples. Um, Mar Rachel, help me with pronunciation. Marseille? Marseille? In France? Marseille? Oh, Marseille. Marseille was a Greek colony. Uh, Byzantium, which will become Constantinople, and then Istanbul. Uh, these, and uh, Cyrene, or Serene, if you prefer. These were all Greek colonies. Uh, there were Greek colonies on the island of Sicily that Rome came into contact with very early on. In fact, that's where the word Greek came from, because that's what the Romans called these people. Hmm. And when they found out they had friends further over that said, oh, you're all a bunch of Greeks. No, we're the sons of Hellas. That's what we said, you're Greeks. <laughs> The Greeks get what they deserved under Alexander. They, did they went it around to everybody else. <laughs> yeah, they did it to everybody else. So when Rome took over, they got to call the Greeks whatever they wanted, and it was the wrong name, and continues to be the wrong name till this day. The things that that defined these city states as being Greek, uh, there are five. They had a common ancestor, Helen, thus Hellas, sons of Hellas. They spoke the same language, more or less. They, in time, came to share the 
same religion, that of the Olympian gods. That took a while. Uh, they observed the same temples and shrines like the uh, shrine to Apollo at Delphi and that to Zeus at Olympia. And they all participated in the Olympic Games because getting together and fighting with people every four years builds unity, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, it is funny if you're uh, studying Greek at any point to come across the Spartan names mm. after reading a bunch of Athenian names. <laughs> um, my freshman. Greek class was struggling to pronounce, you know, every single word because it's a freshman Greek class. Right. Um, but the names, especially of the Athenians, were hard. And my teacher was like, "Just wait, just wait till you get to the Lacedaemonian names." <laughs> <laughs> and then we encountered some. We're like, "Oh, this is the worst. How are these the same peoples?" Yeah. Well. <laughs> right. Speaking of Lacedaemonian, we call them Spartan. Right. They didn't call themselves <laughs> it's a lot easier that. to say. <laughs> you know, winners get to name everybody else. Uh, after the uh, the Medo, uh, Medo the uh, Greco Persian Wars, these Greek city states decided to form a league. It was called the Delian League because the treasury was on the little island of Delos, and Athens took the lead. And this is the age of Pericles, the golden age of Greece, the age when all kinds of famous people put in their appearance on the stage of history for a short time. Um, and so we're dealing with people like um, Thespis, Thespis, <laughs> the first actor, um, Aeschylus, the uh, playwright, um, Phidias, the sculptor, Sophocles, Euripides, other playwrights, Herodotus, the so-called father of history, because of course the Bible doesn't <laughs> count. Uh, Thucydides, who tried to describe war in terms of natural causes rather than divine intervention. Hippocrates, who tried to find naturalistic causes for diseases and such. Uh, Democritus, who put forth the atomic theory, everything is made of little indivisible particles called atoms. And Plato and Aristotle and all of that. This It's important to keep emphasizing, I think, that this was a blip in Greek history. Uh, if you read the secular histories, unless you read very carefully, and they're they're going out of their way to be very honest, one is left with the feeling generally that for you know centuries or generations, Greece was this place that just poured out beautiful architecture and uh, light statuary and, and hmm? light and learning, light and learning, the <laughs> citadel of freedom, liberty, justice, the good, the pure, the. I, I, yeah. Most of what we we prize as the pinnacle of Greece was really a pinnacle. It was one short generation. Uh, and it was a generation where the ruling class was a small percentage of the total population. There were lots and lots of slaves. There were lots and lots of uh, people descended from the original settlers who had no vote, who had no political voice in that culture. And and the thing that we have not mentioned, and before we go on, we at least have to kind of point at it. This was also the pinnacle of Greek education, which mm -hmm. is to say, this is a time when the normal way a young man got educated, if he were was upper class, was to find a male lover who would look after his interests and teach him the ropes of life. Because dad was too busy with business to care about junior. Mom is locked up in the kitchen someplace, and pedestry becomes a way of life for Greek education. Mm -hmm. This is not speculation. This is not um, Christians looking back and wagging fingers. This is what they said of themselves. They were very proud of it, and they considered it somewhat barbaric not to have adopted it. Yes, they admit they got it from Sparta, but... Uh, but it's institutionalized. It's yeah. throughout their, the mystery cults. It's, I mean, you can think of the worst examples of hazing in college fraternities today yeah. um, and say, yeah, we know exactly where they got that. Yeah. So what you have probably been told about the golden age of Greece is almost certainly slanted. It may be largely a bunch of lies. Yes, there were smart people who 
talked about great ideas that were mostly wrong and created great art, which was rather beautiful, if somewhat idealistic. Um, and that was, and, and they ruled, or they lived under the rule oftentimes of tyrants. A tyrant being somebody who simply took over because he thought he could do a better job and sometimes could. And this coexisted with slavery. So you might consider that next time you're reading a history book about ancient Greece. These were not the nicest people in the world, but before the coming of Christ, there weren't a lot of nice people in the world. <laughs> That's That was the reality of the darkness that dominated the whole planet until mm -hmm. Jesus came. Yeah. Uh, so we got as far as this, this Delian League. Uh, that eventually falls apart, and Sparta decides it wants to be the big boss, the big dog in the corner. And we get the Peloponnesian Wars. Peloponnesus is the, the little blob on the end of the Greek peninsula. Uh, so basically Sparta and her friends fighting Athens and her friends. As this is being resolved, and we're passing into a couple other upheavals, there is a young king named Philip. He is from Macedon. Macedon is to the north. It was Greek speaking, and you may Christians may remember that when Paul was trying to figure out where to go next in Asia Minor and whether or not he should go eastward back into stuff that was closer to home for him, uh, he had a vision of a man dressed like a Macedonian saying, "Come and." What what's the phrase? Come and not save us, but come and come and bear witness to us. I forget the exact words of the Mas so called Macedonian call. Um, and so when Paul ends up in Philippi, that's Macedon. It's Greek speaking, it's Greek culture, and yet the other Greekish city states kind of frowned upon it. Uh, Philip. Uh, had spent three years as a hostage in Greece as a result of um, some of the wars that were going on there. And and he, from his part, kind of liked Greece. He, he was enamored of the culture and the lifestyle and such. And and what do you do when you're a king and you really admire another country? You make your country like theirs. Oh, that would... Uh, you are so cute. Uh, <laughs> you go take no, their country? You go take their country from them oh. is what you do, yeah. I'm, I'm not a king. <laughs> Uh, and so he began moving against the Greek city-states one after another, because again, there's no Greece, there's no unified response, and the city-states have to decide how individually, one by one, what they're going to do. Some yield, some fight, they lose. Meanwhile, in Athens, there is an orator named Demosthenes um, who denounces Philip, from which a denunciatory, vicious speech is today, well, at least a couple of generations ago, was called a, a Philippic mm. because Philip. Um, the other thing we know about Denosthenes is that he was apparently born um, with kind of a, a mush mouth who stuttered and couldn't speak clearly. His solution was go down to the seashore, take a bunch of pe pebbles, put them in his mouth, and enunciate over the pebbles and over the roar of the ocean to learn to speak well. Like Whether in that's the fair true. lady yeah. with the marbles. <laughs> yeah, Does it work exactly. for Demosthenes? It worked for It will Demosthenes. work for Eliza Doolittle. Uh, he tried to convince Athens that Philip was up to no good. In, in the end, though, Philip took all of Greece. And then Philip turned and looked into Asia Minor and beyond at the Persian Empire, which he didn't like for a number of reasons, largely because it was A, Persian, and B, not his. <laughs> uh, and, and so he decided he would go take that. But he died. And his son, Alexander III, came to the throne. Now, skip forward a bit. Why he, why he did what he did, he explains later, and let's hold on to that for a second. But in time, he having Greece at, an, at his disposal and Greek troops at his disposal, he takes them, leads them across the Hellespont into Asia Minor. Asia Minor falls, he confronts the Persian monarch drives the third, checks him, drives him off, begins to move down the Palestinian coast to Damascus and Tyre and Sidon. This is all prophesied in the book of Zechariah, who sort of checks this off one by one. Alexander goes down and deals with the, the Philistines, who 
basically point out Jerusalem and say, well, if you didn't like us, you're not going to like them at all because they're not half as nice as we are. And they're, they're going to taunt you and do nasty things. So you probably want to go deal with them right away. And Alexander turns his army and moves toward Jerusalem. Well, Jerusalem is in no condition to do much of anything. The Persian Empire can't take on this guy. What are they supposed to do? According to Josephus and the legends that were passed on, the high priest goes into prayer mode, talks to God, please, can't you do something? Where are your miracles? Isn't there something we can do to save our city? And the legends say that God spoke to him in one fashion, another dream or something, and said, what you need to do is put on your priestly garments, open up the gates of the city, and have the whole city go out and meet him. Any way you look at it, this was this was going to be a good move. And so they do, and the, the city goes are open, and everybody's there with palm branches welcoming their new conqueror, their friend, their future king. And Alexander's nodding and moving on. It's, this is mine, all mine. And then he sees the high priest in his high priestly garments and stops and gets down from his horse and looks at the man and runs up to the man, and all of his generals are thinking, okay, how has this guy ticked Alexander off so quickly? And Alexander falls on his knees before the priest, who then lifts him up, greets him, and ushers him into the temple, where he shows him the prophecies of Daniel that speak of a great king from Greece coming, a king who will do according to his will, uh, and uh, who will destroy the Persian Empire. And he helps Alexander offer sacrifices to Jehovah, to Yahweh. And when all is said and done, Alexander goes his way and leaves Jerusalem under his special protection. So Jerusalem, for a time, is fine. The story continues that Alexander's generals came to him later and said, what was that, boss? All these people are bowing to you and cheering you and honoring you, and here you are honoring this barbarian priest. What's that all about? He says, when I was in uh, Macedon, contemplating whether or not my dad's idea was any good, whether or not we really had a chance of bringing down the whole Persian Empire, I, I was asleep and I had this dream and I saw this vision of a man, very strangely dressed, inviting me into Asia Minor, promising me that this all would be mine. And so I went. I never had seen a man dressed like that before or since until today. The man I saw was this Jewish high priest, and therefore I do him honor. Take that for what it's worth. That's Josephus' account of somebody's account of why Alexander spared Jerusalem. Alexander continued down into Egypt, which, was in a, which had been an Assyrian, then a Persian province. It fell into his hands without any real opposition. He founded the city of Alexandria. <laughs> and made it the cultural center of the coming age. You were mentioning all the names that we give to this period. One you missed is this is also called the Alexandrian Age. Not for Alexander's sake, but for the sake of the city and the museum and library there. It was the cultural mm. center of the world. Anyhow, uh, Alexander goes out into the Egyptian desert to the Oracle of Amon and asks the Oracle, who's, who's for Egypt on the equivalent of the, the Oracle of Delphi, and ask him, my mom used to say that I was the son of Zeus, that in fact Zeus came to her one night in the form of a serpent and lay with her, and I was the product. I'm the seed of the serpent, as it were. This sounds very familiar. <laughs> Can you confirm this? Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that is, you are exact, your mom was so telling the truth. That's exactly who and what you are. You are the son of Amon Ra, of Zeus Amon Ra, or whatever you want to call it, of the great king of the gods. And therefore, you are a rightful Pharaoh. Go be one. You can leave a tip at the door. And so Alexander goes forth to conquer the rest of the Persian Empire, secure in the knowledge that he is the son of the divine son, the seed of the serpent, a son of God and therefore, in theory, unstoppable. Pretty much is. For his we're short almost, life. <laughs> yeah, for his short life, which we're almost to. He got as far as the Indus River, the borders of India, 
At which point his Greek army said, we want to go home because that's what this is all we've signed on for. <laughs> Alexander went into his tent and moped, hoping to break their hearts, but they stood firm. No, we're going home. We're done here. And according to at least one legend, Alexander said, my astronomers tell me there are other worlds in the sky and I have not even conquered one. Blah. We feel so bad for you, Alexander. Yes. <laughs> he went back to Babylon. And now Rachel's going to tell us about the uh, people's theories concerning his death in just a second. But one, one thing that does fit at this point, Alexander had been trying to find a way to merge the Greek peoples with the Persian peoples, to merge the two cultures. The Greek empire he had created with the Persian empire that existed. And he thought it would be great if there were a world capital that was appropriately located. And as he returned, he found what was left of Babylon and said, wow, what a perfect site for a world capital. <laughs> what an original thought. <laughs> yeah. I will make this the center of my empire and the center of world government. He was dead really shortly after that because God <laughs> had said of Babylon, it's never going to be rebuilt. So, And so, Rachel, tell us about Alexander's death. <laughs> All right. Well, he was only 32 at the time and had appeared to be wonderfully healthy and strong. And then he suddenly got sick and died 11 days later. So there has been no end of theories of what caused this because it wasn't immediate. Um, so it seems like maybe it was some sort of sudden onset disease or maybe somebody was trying to assassinate him, but it was a slow assassination. <laughs> um, they, but the biggest problem is they don't have his body. <laughs> and therefore, they cannot do any sort of exhuming autopsy. Uh, they have to depend on sources from, you know, almost 2,500 years ago. Uh, so, again, the theories go all over the place. The latest theory is that he may have contracted West Nile virus um, because it seemed that he had sudden onset of fever, neurological symptoms, and extreme abdominal pain. Uh, the other favorite theories include necrotizing pancreatitis and mm. encephalopathy with some <laughs> peritonitis mixed in to give him the fever with the stomach pain. Uh, others include things like Guillain-Barre syndrome, some things I can't even pronounce. Um, or I love, they go through this whole list of all these diseases and then end with, or arsenic poisoning. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that takes 11 days to kill you, but maybe I'm wrong. Well, you see, uh, he stopped for 11 days to visit these nice old ladies and have yes. some tea and wine with them. Yeah. And every day they put a little bit in his cup. So whatever it was, it's it's very sudden um, where he seems perfectly fine and then just dies like that. Uh, so nobody's prepared for his death, obviously, because he had he was only 32 years old. Um, and granted, he had been a military leader now for 16 years, but that's still, they would have expected a lot more from him. So <laughs> the theories go all over the place. And if you want to go down a deep hole, you could probably spend hours in all of the the literature that has been produced by what killed Alexander. <laughs> um, interesting. Well, maybe not, but I'll bring it up anyway. Side note, um, I always was under the impression that Alexander died at 33. And then when I started doing my research for this, I kept seeing the number 32 all over the place. And eventually, the one side that yielded 33 was Britannica. What is going on here? And so finally, I said, all right, I simply have to count. <laughs> It turns out that he was about one ah. month short of being 33. <laughs> but, so Britannica rounds, nobody else <laughs> so does. It's a question of whether Haven't we're going to round up yet. or round down. <laughs> because he hasn't technically reached it yet by a month. We're going to say 32. 32 and 11 months. <laughs> yeah, it's, it sounds like you're a small child. Yeah. <laughs> I'm 32 and 11 twelfths. Um, <laughs> What happens next was foretold by Daniel, and I want to read 
two of the passages. So this is Daniel chapter 8. Daniel says, I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. The, the animals and beasts in Daniel's vision represent empires. This is one that has two dimensions, uh, the second one coming up last, Medes and the Persians. And I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no beast might stand before him, neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, behold, an he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth, and touched not the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes, one powerful point of force. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran unto him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with choler against him, and smote the ram and break his two horns, and there was no power in the ram to stand before him. But he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land, that's Canaan. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the hosts and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, probably the high priest. And by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of the sanctuary was cast down, and a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of the transgression, that is, the transgression of God's people. And he cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. And there's, there's a bit more. Later, oh, we actually do have an interpretation in case we missed it. Later on, Daniel was told, the ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia. And the great horn that's between his eyes is the first king. Now, that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are, and this is God's people transgressing, are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also shall cause craft to prosper. In his hand he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes. That would be, I would take a Messiah. But he shall be broken without hand. And that wraps up. But in chapter 11, which we began to look at last time, we have something similar. The, the revealing angel says, uh, chapter 11, verse 1, Also I in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him, and now I will show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, the fourth shall be greater, or shall be far richer than all they, that would be Xerxes. And by his strength through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. And a mighty king, this would be Alexander, shall stand up and shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled for his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others besides those. Rachel, did you look further at, at what happened after Alexander's death or... So after Alexander's death, we have four of his generals who divide up his empire. So the great world empire doesn't last for very long. And instead, we get um, smaller empires that will at times be friends with each other at, and at times be at war with each other uh, and will then produce different dynasties. So in Egypt, we get the Ptolemy dynasty from Ptolemy sign founding that. Uh, and then the other one that we tend to focus on because it's more to do with um, Daniel's prophecy and what happens to God's people uh, to the north is the Seleucid dynasty 
that is starts from Syria and more Syria and Babylon area. Uh, and then the that interim space where we have God's people will kind of go back and forth between the two. And sometimes one side will be more favorable to the Jewish people and sometimes the other. Uh, and sometimes they will uh, attack and kill and try to destroy God's people and go for uh, rounds of genocide. <laughs> uh, I believe that um, that you did research in the books of Maccabees. Uh, on the Maccabean Rebellion, yes. Yeah. Um, for people who not do not know, when, when you were a child doing sword drills, that's where the teacher calls out a chapter, a book and a chapter in the Bible and a verse you're supposed to find it real fast. Some smart old teacher eventually would say, First Maccabees, chapter three, and everyone would start to turn and they realize, wait a second. <laughs> that's not in my Bible. That's not in my Bible. It's in Roman Catholic Bible, so it's not because it should be, but simply because it is. So there's the reference for, for those of you who may have never heard of Maccabees before. You might have been told about her. It might have been mentioned in some Sunday school drill once upon a time. Not inspired scripture, written in Greek, doesn't claim to be the work of a prophet, is very much a political sort of a document. And it describes the how bad things got under one of the uh, Seleucid kings. But before, Rachel, I have you talk about that thing. As we go on in Daniel, I just want to read a couple of verses to show you what's what happens. If I can get my light to shine where I need it to. Picking up where I left off, the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes, he shall be strong above him, he shall have dominion, his dominion shall be a great dominion. At the end of the years, they shall join themselves together, for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agree. And he goes on, king of the south, king of the north, king of the south, king of the north, until eventually that back and forth is broken, and the last, so you said, king mentioned is Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes. Epiphanes means, um, well, we have the holiday in some Christian circles of Epiphany, mm -hmm. the manifestation of Christ to the world. It means God manifest. The man was not So humble. this guy had no ego whatsoever. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, what he did have was an ongoing rivalry with the Ptolemaic dynasty in Egypt. And when the Pharaoh... These these were these were descendants of Alexander's generals, so they're Greek. They're Greek speaking, Greek culture, Greek literature, all that, Greek philosophy. But they conformed to proper usages, and so the Ptolemies called themselves pharaohs. When the pharaoh reigning pharaoh died, he left a young son behind, and Antiochus Epiphanes, the Syrian king, who at this point controlled Palestine, said, "Oh, I'm sure." The little boy needs the help of his uncle Epiphanes. Let me go down and see if I can be of comfort and aid and kind of, you know, run things for him. What he didn't know was that the late Pharaoh had willed oversight of the kingdom and the boy to this little city on the far side of the Mediterranean no one ever really heard of, this thing called Rome, <laughs> that had ships stationed at Cyprus. And so by the time Antiochus got to the borders of Egypt with his army, he ran into a Roman ambassador with his army. And the Roman ambassador went out to meet him, told him to go home. Antiochus demurred, and the Roman ambassador took a stick and drew a circle around him and said, do not step out of Antiochus demurred, or you're going to deal with my army. Antiochus fumed and fussed and went home in a really bad mood. And once again, the Philistines were not helpful. You know what the Jews have been doing while you were gone? <laughs> <sighs> now, up to this point, Antiochus had been trying to play nice guy to the younger Jewish generation, uh, convinced them that it was cool to be Greek, that all, all the cool kids are doing it. You know, uh, he built a, an amphitheater and a theater, um, pushed Greek culture, Greek language, invited these young men to participate in the Olympic Games, which were done in the nude. Some of them, for fear of embarrassment, applied needle and thread and something to make themselves not seem circumcised. But when he got, when Antiochus got back from the encounter in Egypt, he just had enough. These Jews are too much trouble. This ends now. Um, and Rachel, can you pick it up from there? 
Uh, sure. So when he returns, he decides to go for total, total adoption of Greek culture among the Jews and uh, proceeds to go and defile the temple, uh, erect an idol on the altar and sacrifice uh, on the altar, thus fully defiling the temple, um, and then outlaws the basic elements of outward signs of being Jewish, such as circumcision and observing the Sabbath, and actually makes them um, punishable by the death penalty. So pretty much we see in the law not keeping those is supposed to give you the death penalty, and he flips it on its head to say, if you do them, now I'm going to punish you, um, and makes it so that they shouldn't be praying, they shouldn't be in any way acting like they are Jewish. Uh, and he, after doing this in Jerusalem, begins to spread out into the countryside, and basically they start setting up idol altars or um, defiling altars they find forcing the Jewish communities out there to to sacrifice uh, to these idols or face punishment um, the Antiochus Epiphanes had set up. And they continue in this way until they meet a priest named Meta Mattathias, uh, who has a number of sons. And Mattathias refuses to sacrifice. In fact, he prevents others from sacrificing. and um, To the false gods. To the false gods, yes. Um, they Because the officers of Antiochus Epiphanes were trying to go around and force everybody to do this. So he steps in, stands up to them, and tears down the altar or the idol, and instead calls for everyone who is zealous for the law and who stands by the covenant to follow him, which is a quote from First Maccabee, Maccabees. And from there, he and his sons become the center of a multi-year revolt. Uh, where Mattathias begins it, but he dies in the middle, and his son Judas takes over, who is actually the one given the term Maccabee, uh, Maccabees, which actually means hammer. It's funny that we get a number of people in history <laughs> that get to be the hammer. Um, Screwdriver but, doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, something we, we, we want to about know, that. <laughs> apply force. Um, and so Judas is able to start beginning as a kind of a, we would call a guerrilla warfare style against uh, Antiochus Epiphanes leading towards creating an actual army. Uh, and he's able to beat Antiochus and his forces multiple times, uh, and particularly one where Antiochus sends somewhere around 60,000 men against Judas. And he wins by praying to the Lord and asking the Lord to deliver them. And they have what we would consider a somewhat miraculous victory uh, until they are finally able to defeat Antiochus's uh, enemies and retake Jerusalem. And that is where we come to something we know nowadays where they have to rededicate the temple because it's been defiled. And they go to do that and find when they want to burn the oil on the menorah, they only have enough oil for one day. But miraculously, the Lord causes it to last for eight days. And so we get what will be celebrated even by Jesus in the New Testament as the Feast of Hanukkah or uh, Hanukkah in modern times. Uh, that Festival does roughly of Festival of Lights, yes, because they were lighting the menorah in the temple. But it, it roughly corresponds. I saw one that said it happened on December 25th. I'm a little suspicious that they knew that exact date. That is exactly <laughs> Christmas or Christmas as we now call it, but it is generally around that time of year. And so that is where it continues today as the so-called Jewish holiday of that time period. Or the There's a Christmas. really great um, vocal parody song. Um, mm -hmm. The original song is Dynamite by Tayo Cruz, but the, vocal group that writes the parody and performs it is called the Maccabees. Um, <laughs> oh, wow. You know, fun musical pun there, but they tell the story of the Maccabean revolt. And I, I want to say like everything I know about the Maccabean revolt is from that. That's not true because I did read Maccabees in college, but <laughs> everything I remember about the <laughs> Maccabean revolt is from this song. There is oh. a certain truth there for music teachers. <laughs> yes. 
Back to Daniel, this is what Daniel says concerning Antiochus Epiphanes. There's actually a very long section. This is toward the end. At the time appointed, he, Antiochus, shall return and come toward the south into Egypt, but it shall not be as the former or the latter, for ships of Ketim, Cyprus, these are the Roman galleon stationed there, shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do, he shall even return and have intelligence, intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant, and arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword, by flame, by captivity, and by spoil many days. Now, when they shall fall, they shall be helped with a little help. But many shall cleave to them with flatteries, and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them, and to purge, and to make them white even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. And then the narrative shifts in the prophecy. Uh, the This whole section describing the Seleucid and the Ptolemaic kings is so accurate in its forecasting that liberals traditionally have looked at Daniel and said, well, of course, it's absolutely accurate because it was written after the fact. How else could he possibly <laughs> know all these things? So Daniel was not written by Daniel, but by some other pious Jew who deliberately perpetrated a pious fraud upon his people. He wrote in the days of Antiochus Epiphanes to encourage them, and his prophecies are nothing more than history recorded as prophecy. And um, yes, yeah, so we don't have to worry about any of you fundies trying to pass this off as fulfilled prophecy. It actually was written way after the fact. That's called mm. desperation. Yeah. The evidence that it was written after the fact consists in your insistence that prophecy does not exist. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's more your pre presupposition issue than the text mm -hmm. issue. And it also ignores the fact that Daniel is one of the last books that we have before the 400 silent years yeah. gives God's people a roadmap and a reassurance that God is still in control and he's mm -hmm. still orchestrating redemptive history towards that point of the stone coming to crush these coming empires so that they, when they don't have all that reassurance of prophets and such, they can still look back to Daniel. Yeah, yeah. that really struck me today. Um, I think for the first time of how much of a comfort that must mm -hmm. have been. It's kind of like, you know, when I've taken my little, little girl to the doctor and she's going to get a shot or whatever. It's like, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen, and it's going to be really awful for a brief moment. <laughs> but I need to tell you about it ahead of time so that you know that it's planned, that there's a reason, and it will be over. You know, that never worked with me, but um, <laughs> if it worked with Gretchen, that's great. Gretchen, Gretchen's pretty uh, circumspect about these things. I'm thankful. <laughs> I, I, I had a real paranoia where needles and sharp things like wasp stingers were involved. Mm. I got over it when I had to go through a whole bunch of blood tests one year. Anyhow, um, to step back for a moment and to sum up, so we call it the 400 silent years because after Nehemiah and Malachi, there is no prophetic voice. There's no Shekinah glory visible in the temple. Uh, there are no miracles. All forms of supernatural revelation go on hold. But, as you've said, we have Daniel, we have Daniel's countdown. We have the empires, um, Golden, Babylon, Argent, uh, Persia, Brazen, Greece, and Iron Rome. We have the chronology uh, implied in the 490 years from the decree of Cyrus to the coming of Messiah the Prince. We have Daniel 10 and 11 and 12 that mark off the king of the south, the king of the, the Seleucid kings, the Ptolemaic kings. This is how they're going to act back and forth. We still have one last ungodly king who appears before Messiah. We'll talk about him later. Uh, it, it, it's all there. God's people, meanwhile, are scattered throughout the world. They have 
these things called synagogues, where they meet on the Sabbath day to worship, to pray, to read the Old Testament scriptures, and they turn around and they evangelize their Gentile friends and win many to the God of Israel. This should sound really familiar, <laughs> because this is exactly what the church was going to be called to. God already is working with a sort of proto-church to get his people used to this kind of life, dispersed through a pagan world, worshiping the Lord on one particular day, worshiping him uh, with the worship that's centered around the Word, the reading of Scripture, sermons based upon it. Uh, what's missing is the sacraments. Uh, there was still a temple standing where sacrifices were still being altered, but most Jewish people never saw it. And although they were supposed to go to Jerusalem for Passover, if they could, many just flat out couldn't. And so this became God seeding the ancient world, not only with an ongoing testimony to the coming Messiah, but also God laying out um, bases of operation for the apostles when they showed up. James could say at the Council of Jerusalem, every city has a synagogue where Moses is read. And so every time we follow Paul in the book of Acts, he goes, first of all, to the Jewish synagogue in town and starts there and then reaches out to the Gentiles. So God is using this very deliberately. Another thing that we haven't mentioned is as Alexander's troops spread across what had been the Persian Empire, they took their language with them, what we know as Canaan Greek which is the language in which the New Testament was written. It became the second language of the ancient world, even superseding Latin. Latin's great as a legal language. It's not great for eloquence and other things. So everybody learned Greek, and when the apostles wanted to write, when God had them write the New Testament, there was one obvious language that everybody could actually read. Meanwhile, there's Rome, and that's where we need to go next before we come to Jesus. We need to go back and pick up Rome. I mentioned Alexandria. This is the heart of Hellenistic culture, Hellen Hellenic Greek, Hellenistic Greek-like. The culture that permeated this time and these countries, Greek literature, Greek philosophy, Greek language, Greek art forms, Greek rulers. It's Greek all over the place. Uh, and that gives a common background against which the apostles can write the New Testament and make sense of it. Uh, and I was going to take a tangent on the on the Museum of Alexandria, but maybe some other time. Yeah, we're kind of getting short on time. Yeah, so that's where we are. But before we can take that next step out of the silence into God speaking again, we got to go back and pick up Rome. So we're going to go back a few hundred years and back to the Trojan War, back to Aeneas, and then to Romulus and Remus, and then zip <laughs> through the kingdom, the republic, the oligarchy, and the empire. So we'll start that process, Lord willing, next time. All right. Look forward to it. Shall we wrap up with some recommendations for today? Sure. I have one. I used to do this all the time. I'm trying to do it now. Ladies, you may be better at this already because you have these things called purses and you can put stuff in them <laughs> and carry them around. Guys just have pockets. I don't know how many complaints I've had from my wife and daughters about guys having pockets. But it's purses have really a, unfair. Yeah. But purses, <laughs> you can put bigger things in them. And like what books. I'm, like books. But what I'm thinking of is more something along the line of small journals. Uh, things you can write in, book. things you can make notes in, things you can write story ideas in, mm -hmm. keep addresses in. Keep write down directions. Write down clever things that you or somebody else have said. Uh, as I say, I used to I used to do this. I was um, I, I found my old uh, call it a journal for lack of anything else. My old notebook. It's full of my mom and dad's uh, personal autobiographies or stories as they told mm -hmm. them to me. Like, wow, that's really cool. I'm glad I had something to write in. So I recommend that male or female, you find a way to carry a writing instrument and writing material with you so that you can record snippets of your life, your thought, and the wonderful things you hear. You, some of you may already do this for sermons. Just expand it mm -hmm. and um, see what God may do with this in your life as you, at the end of the week of the month, go back and flip through and say, oh, wow, I forgot all about that. <laughs> I used to just write down quotes from TV shows. I still have those. Anyway, my recommendation, Emily? Yeah. Let 
idea reminds me of a commonplace book. Of course, mm-hmm. I have my bullet journal, but I, I hear a lot of people ranting and raving about how wonderful it is to keep a commonplace book. Yeah. Um, my recommendation for today is highly local to Northern California. So listener, if you're in Northern California, I recommend giving some amount of business to the baker and the cake maker in Auburn. Mm. Um, they have pastries. Oh. <laughs> and like, I tell you, you know, we went to Switzerland this summer and I got back and I was like, there's just, there's nowhere to get pastries. Like there's pastries. You know what Starbucks has. <laughs> it's not the same. <laughs> it's not the same. You know, the the fresh fruit on the custard, on the the mm-hmm. things you would see on the Great British Baking Show. Mm-hmm. I was like, we, we just don't have that. And then we stopped one day by the baker and the cake maker in Auburn, California. And they had pastries with nectarines on them and custard. <laughs> and it was a delight. And so I said, David, next time I am complaining that nowhere has pastries, remind me that this place exists. So they do close at four in the afternoon, which is, you know, better than a bakery in Europe, mm. um, but not as good as a Starbucks as far as convenience. But there you have are. you ever been to the French bakery in Monterey? No, I haven't. I don't think I've been to Monterey since I was like two years old. Well, I am not an authority on pastries, but given my wife's repeated returns to said bakery, it (laughs) must be awfully good on the order of, well, a French bakery. So Monterey, (laughs) look it up. It's easy to find. Not so easy to find a parking place anywhere near, but (laughs) aside from that, it's, it's, you'll find it easily enough. Rachel. All right. I am continuing on my recommendations of podcasts that I have been Mm -hmm. listening to. Uh, And so this one is actually available through two different podcasts because uh, the Alicia Childers podcast re-podcasted. Is that a verb? I don't know. (laughs) Uh, She re-broadcasted. Yeah, re-released a podcast from another group um, called All the Things, which is uh, put on by the Center for Biblical Unity. Mm-hmm. And it was very fascinating. The The original one is longer than the one she puts up because she clips it. So depending on which length you want, but it is on the woke right. Mm-hmm. And it was very fascinating and completely not something I had heard about at all. Uh, and even the lady on the podcast was going, I'm starting to see these things. Is this is this an actual movement developing? Um, but it's basically there through social media and various other places. There seems to be a, a rising rhetoric of those on the right starting to pick up a lot of the language of the woke left, but inserting their own uh, terms and people. And so they're, they are becoming the oppressed. The oppressed are the mm. white males. The oppressors <laughs> are all of these others that have been holding them down. Um, but one of the interesting things was in the middle of it, it uh, seems to have a rise in anti-Semitism coming mm. in, which blinks in with a lot of the Israeli war going on right now. And so there tends to be a lot of negative um negativity towards them and a return to seeing them, the Jewish people, as one of the primary instigators of all the evils of the world um, in in a lot of ways. So it's, it's just very fascinating and not something I was aware of at all. So I put it out there for those of you that find such things interesting. <laughs> yeah. I, I had come across the fringes of such things and had not considered that that could be actually a you know, but it, it's a basically thing with force see, behind it. Yeah, you hold one side down, and eventually they jump up and start hitting back, and that's kind of what they're saying on the podcast. Of you, you basically, you who claim to be oppressed have become the oppressors, and guess what? Now those of the other side is hitting back uh, but on their own terms. Using yeah, but they're using language. the same language, which is what's really mm-hmm. interesting. Is they're using a lot of that Marxist yeah. language that. Mm. Seems like it shouldn't belong. So it's it's interesting. (laughs) Always new battles to fight. And it's always the same battle over and over. I was going to say, yeah, yeah, Mm -hmm. all the same things still apply. (laughs) Why we shouldn't follow that. Well, uh, 
This has been great. Thank you both so much for this conversation. A uh, big thank you also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. A uh, big thank you to our financial supporters for keeping the show rolling and supplying our wonderful editing software. We really appreciate it. David saves so much time. Thank you. Big thank you also to our transcriptionist who makes this show available in your inbox via our Substack. If you'd like to subscribe to that, look us up on Substack, Halting Towards Zion. Um, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. And we'd, we'd love to hear from you. I think that's about, about the size of it. So I will say good night. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Bye.